the Hulco has for many decades been really fundamental to the organization of China's economy. It's really central to how the state manages and controls people. It's worked for a long time like an internal passport system between the cities and the countryside. It was originally designed to enable the cities and urban industry specifically to develop by extracting resources from the countryside. In other words, by exploiting rural resources and the labour of rural people. The reason for that is that they couldn't develop by extracting resources by going overseas and colonising other countries the way that, for example, the British had done with India. In this video, I'll talk about why the Hukou was set up in the first place and how it underpinned China's development from the 50s to the 70s. Please note, I'm not going to be talking about how the Hukou operated during the market reform period, which is the period after that. It operated quite differently at that point. I'm also not going to be talking in this video about the recent Hukou reforms. There are actually efforts at the moment to get rid of the urban-rural distinction. All of that's very important, but it's a separate topic for a different video. The Hukou was first established in the 50s and developed over time and eventually took its fullest form in 1958, just as the Great Leap Forward was being launched. Arguably, it does have a much longer history than this. There have been forms of household registration in China dating back many, many centuries, also, the Hukou was actually largely influenced by the Soviet Propiska system. That was a system of urban registration that restricted the number of people living in cities. Here's how it actually works. It's a permit which everyone in China has, or at least is supposed to have, which designates where they live and work. It looks like this. You can see here the various details of the person, the name blocked out here, the place of birth, which here is Liaoning province, the date of birth, again blocked out here, the ethnic group, which is Han in this case, religious faith, this person is not religious, the person is male, whether the person is married, this person is not married, and the occupation, this person is a student. That's all fine, but here's the really crucial part. This person is characterised as non-agricultural. The characters here say that this is a non-agricultural household registration permit. The central job of the Hukou was to designate everyone in the population as either urban, non-agricultural, or rural agricultural. And based on their hukou, people were assigned to a place of work. So in the countryside, that would be a rural large collective farm or commune. And in the cities, that might be a factory or a bureaucratic office of some kind. Whether people were categorised as urban or rural, depending on their hukou, had a huge impact on their lives. To a large extent, it designated whether or not they were winners or losers. The reason for that is that the state allocated public goods that people were entitled to depended on their hukou. For those living in the cities, they got more, and that included access to housing, people's schooling for their children, and also healthcare. For those living in the countryside, the state didn't provide this. It had to be provided by the collective farms or the communes that people belonged to, or lower down by the production teams that people were organised into within those communes. Under this system, agricultural labour could be easily organised and managed by the state, and grain could be procured from these communes at cheap cost and transferred to the cities to supply the needs of the urban industrial workforce, leaving just enough over for the agricultural workers who had produced the grain in the first place to live on. At least when the system actually worked. By extracting grain from the countryside at low cost, the state could prioritise basically the standard of living in the cities to industrialise as fast as possible, which was really 
the goal. The agricultural workers couldn't just up and move to the cities where the living standards were generally higher because they were tied to their place of work by the huko. So why did Chinese policymakers put this system into practice in the first place? First, because they had to build up China's economy and industry when they were also facing serious levels of international hostility not least from the United States, who was very angry because they hadn't expected the communists to win in the Civil War and come to power in the first place. The United States refused to accept China as a legitimate state at all. They recognized Taiwan at first as being the real China, and they had set out immediately to make sure that the fledgling People's Republic of China failed, including putting in place a trade embargo and several strategically located military bases surrounding China, part of a policy of containment. This meant that for practical reasons, the possibility of developing by international trade and markets was pretty difficult. Not impossible, there was some of this, but it wasn't something the Communist Party were willing to rely on at this point as their central development model. And second, there was no way that China could follow European experiences of industrialization by colonizing other countries, partly because of the international situation. It just wasn't possible, but also because a fundamental anti-colonial and anti-imperialist stance was central to what the Chinese Communist Party stood for, because they themselves had experienced so many imperialist incursions into their own territory for a long time up to this point, starting with the British Opium Wars in the 1800s, right up until the 1930s and the Japanese invasion. Big caveat here, the claim that China's Communist Party did not then or does not now practice imperialism or colonialist policies is open to dispute. That is a really important issue, but topic for other videos, not this one. The Communist Party leaders had also come to power, of course, promising to protect China from the ravages of international capitalism, which as far as they were concerned would only leave their country in a backward, undeveloped state while predatory foreign businesses came in and took full advantage. So perhaps ironically, but facing a real lack of viable options, the Communist Party had to develop China's industry by exploiting themselves instead. Here's how the famous agricultural economist in China, Wen Jun, has put it. China did not, as did Western states, carry out plunder and expansion externally, but mainly deployed internal self-exploitation, extracting accumulation from the countryside. It's pretty well documented that as a result of this, life in China's countryside over the long term tended to be far harsher than life in the cities. Policymakers today are still grappling with this legacy and what is still now a very deeply entrenched, unequal urban-rural divide. How they deal with that now is subject to dispute and debates right at the top levels of the Chinese Communist Party and the outcome will have huge implications for China's future development. Thank you for watching.